Hi, I'm Ted Wolf, presented by Guidewise. Welcome to the Implementers Podcast, where we connect you to the stories and insights of people who have mastered implementation. Why? Because ideas are easy, but implementation is hard. Join us as we uncover the secrets of successful implementation so you can conquer your implementation struggles. Welcome to the Implementers Podcast presented by Guidewise, where we focus on the topic of implementation because ideas are easy, implementation is hard. Today, my guest is Patrick Franci. Patrick is an entrepreneur, a real estate investor, a speaker, an educator, a coach, and he's the host of the acclaimed The Everyday Millionaire Podcast. Welcome, Patrick. Thanks for having me on the show. Um, what was life like before you reached your current level of success? Take us back to the beginning, if you can. Tell us some of the biggest challenges and some of the failures you may have experienced, or I'll say <laughs> learning experiences that you've had. Yeah, I guess they're all learning experiences, aren't they? And interestingly enough is that it's only been the past few years that I've even looked and considered myself successful, which is interesting because I've always enjoyed a degree of success along the way. And you know, it's taken me some time, to be honest with you, to get to a point where I can just have gratitude for the life that I have created, that my wife and I have created together. And when I reflect, I go, you know, something, as many failures as I've had, learning experiences, and I've had many, and most have been incredibly expensive, I find myself today still wanting to achieve more, still wanting to be more, uh, still wanting to show up and be a contribution. And so understanding all the things that drive me. So, you know, long story, uh, I've been in business 40 years. So in terms of entrepreneurship, I did get the message early on that you can be an entrepreneur or you could be a business owner. You could own the asset called a business or you could buy yourself a job in being the entrepreneur. Now, I don't think that one is right and one is wrong. It's just that when I learned that the business that I owned and I have now owned for 40 years, one of the businesses, the other has been around over 30 years. And then of course, within the coaching capacity that my wife and I operate, we've been doing that for 25 plus years. So all of that is to say that along the way, I'm constantly adjusting and changing and aspiring to be more, have more, achieve more, whatever you want to use as that. And along the way, you know, those things that we call failure or not getting the results that we want are part of the process. And we have to meet resistance, number one, to gain the strength to bust through that resistance and to go to the next level. So what I've learned philosophically, at least, is that every time I think or feel like I've hit my ceiling of limitation, I have to look at that and go, no, this, this ceiling of limitation is my new floor. I just got to bust through the ceiling and make it my new floor. So that's what I would call your high performance mindset. You're geared to say, hey, there's more. I can get more out of myself. I'm going to continuously mm -hmm. just improve and learn and do everything I can. Um, because the more successful you become, obviously, with the businesses you have, the more you can help other people. And that's the key to the entire entrepreneurial business experience, I think. Yeah, I agree. And I think that to your point is the high performer self, that A type personality, if you will, uh, whatever it might be, is that along the way, I've had to learn how to redefine success. There was a point in my life where I probably defined my success as, you know, how much money my businesses were generating, how much revenue or how much income I was drawing. And it was pretty focused on the dollars and cents of it. And as much as that's still one of the, of course, business things that I have to do, like, you know, I want to make money, I want to be profitable and all of that. It's less about what drives me. Yes, I want to make money. Yes, I want to be profitable. But now it's in a, I'm in a place where I'm going, I want to continue to make a difference, to be a contribution, to live my purpose and my mission. And along the way, I came to a definition of success for me, which was if I wake up in the morning and I can reflect and say, Am I living my vision? Am I living into my vision? Is this what I signed up for? Is this what I've been trying to create? And if I'm living into my vision, then I consider that successful, whether that be around dollars and cents or just straight out lifestyle or relationships that I might have and new ones that I'm creating. And so where have I made a difference? Is that part of my vision? And if the answer is yes, then I'm going, yeah, I'm feeling pretty good about it all. 
So what made you take the pivot where in the beginning you want to make money, which is very common, Mm -hmm. and all of a sudden, now I'm here to help people? Mm -hmm. Well, I think that what started to happen is that as I made money and I started risking more, I realized that because I was making it about the money that I was also experiencing bigger losses. And so although that can get a little bit deep and a little bit heady, at the end of the day, what I came to the conclusion was I wasn't really there to make money, although I was, it was, what am I doing to bring value to others who would want to pay for it? And so I focused on what is the value? Who are my clients? What is it that I can offer them that's being a contribution that's going to help them achieve their vision, their goals? And when I came to that conclusion, when I came to that place that the products, the services, the team I was building and I have built is really about that front facing. Who are my clients? What are we delivering on? Are we helping them achieve their vision? And when we operate from that place, then we make money and we keep clients and the business continues to prosper. Mm -hmm. So how do you know when you've actually helped an individual grow and help them overcome some obstacles? Well, in the case of our businesses, you know, I, one of my businesses works with young athletes and actually professional and even Olympic class athletes. So for us, it's quite simple in that we know what they're trying to achieve. They want to be the best they can be in the particular sport. In our sport and the sport that we support is ice skating. So ice hockey, uh, figure skating, and that's really our focus, helping even minor hockey and minor league players to be their best. But that also extends this many years later into Olympic and professional players. And so it's all to say that that's easy to measure. You know, they're coming to us. We're creating relationship with them because in the nature of the business, people skate often for a lifetime or they at least skate from the time they're very young to their early or late teens and sometimes into their adulthood, if you will. So for us, it's easy to see that when we're being a contribution, when we're supporting their success, it's because we're supporting them in the equipment they're purchasing, the skates that they're buying, whatever that might be, and setting them up and aligning them with where they are intending to go and what it is they're trying to achieve in their own performance on the ice. That's one example. In my other business, the Real Estate Investment Network, which is RAIN Canada, R-E-I-N Canada, we're actually educating investors on how to create a financial future investing in real estate. Now, the important point there is we don't sell real estate. We are selling how-to proven strategies, have done that for over 30 years, to help people know how to invest in real estate the right way to mitigate risk based on what's happening economically. And so it's easy to see that we have an impact because people are going, hey, this works. I'm retiring early or I've created a very, very powerful financial future and I feel good about the certainty and the security that I've built. So you're helping people be financially secure and build businesses around themselves and things. And I've been on your website. The website is the everyday millionaire.ci. Very nice website. You have a concept that you talk about a little bit called holistic success. I believe you term it. Tell mm-hmm. us a little bit about that. Well, again, I think it takes a, you know, it takes the human part of us into it, understanding that we are human beings, not just human doings. We understand that in the space of creating financial futures and being successful, whatever that might be, we have to also consider that there are people involved and that uh, compassion and empathy matter, that understanding that people go through ups and downs in life and how do we get through those ups and downs? How do we face adversity? that becomes the mindset component of it. So holistically, we don't just look at the doingness of it. Let me share with you this, that in the world of real estate, I've literally been on the stage and coached one-on-one, one-on-many to probably 200,000 people or more have been through our programs. And what I've come to realize is this, Ted, is that we teach the how-tos. You know, it's like, follow this, do this, and you will, in fact, have success. And after coaching thousands of real estate investors or wannabe investors, I see this cohort of people that just crush it. They hit it out of the park. They own multiple doors. They do all of the things and they create the success. And then I come across those individuals who get the same lessons, the same learning, the same coaching, and they don't even get off the sidelines. 
And you start to realize that as many people go, just tell me how, just tell me how, just tell me how, really, you have to get out of your own way and start to become the individual you need to be to achieve that result. So it isn't about the hows, it's about the who are we being. That's the holistic part of it as well. So understanding ourselves, how we operate, what our operating system is, what lights us up. And if it's only driven by money, then generally that's where things come off the rails. You know, what is your why? That's a very popular question for any coach is, you know, why are you doing this? What is driving you? And if it's just money, then it almost always has a tendency to not get done. So let's get into, if we can, a little bit finer detail. In order to be successful, um, it's the be. Who are we going to be? And mm -hmm. that's the important thing we have to drive. But in order to be successful, you have to overcome obstacles. Um, mm -hmm. And that means you have to manage change. Mm -hmm. And that's the hard part of implementing. How do you implement and manage, how do you manage change so you can implement these changes in mindsets to go from a money driven where I want to now, I want to, I want to help people or to be that holistic concept that you were talking about? Well, I think, you know, there's a fundamental around all of this, Ted, and you know, this is that we all want change and ultimately people will stand up and go, I want change. I want my life to be different. I want my job to be different. They want change, but underlying all of that is a lack of willingness because in order to have change, you have to change. So they want change and they want different results, but they don't want to have to change. They want to keep doing the same thing. And therein lies the fundamental problem is that what happens when we start to say, okay, well, I want that vision. I want to achieve that goal and that vision for my life. There's a cost that comes with it because if you're not there yet, and if you're not surrounded by the right people, as a matter of fact, if you're complaining about life, if you're not feeling that joy, that happiness, that what is getting me out of bed in the morning drive, then you have to understand that as you change, people are going to go out of your life. You're going to be judged. People are going to say you're crazy. Friends that you've had maybe for years, even family are going to go, what the hell? Are you part of a cult? What's all this change about? So they don't want you to change because it serves them. They want the Ted that they know. They don't want the Ted that's all of a sudden up and reflecting on his life and going, you know something, this isn't good enough. These conversations aren't good enough. I'm not going to blame. I'm not going to complain. I'm going to take responsibility for my life because I've come to understand that my life is a reflection of who I am being. And if I don't like my life, then I got to take responsibility for it and put in the changes that I need to break out of this process, this operating system that I'm on. It's kind of like we've got this software wired into us and we have to rewrite the software or upgrade the operating system, whatever analogy or metaphor you want to use. And the resistance comes and why so few people really do this work is because that comes at a cost. And sometimes it comes at the cost of changing jobs. It comes at the cost of uh, losing friends, of being judged by others. It takes a lot to be a standout. You know, we all can be guilty of living a life of mediocrity because we don't want to get uncomfortable. And making change is uncomfortable. Growing, facing adversity is in fact uncomfortable. And some people are just not wired to be willing to go through that transition. Because with transition, and I'll leave it on this note, with change, you have to go through the proverbial eye of the needle. You have to go through the transitional part to come out the other side and go, oh, okay, here I am. I've got to my new floor. Mm -hmm. So how do you, in your experience, what have you found to be the best process of guiding people through that needle to get from yeah. side A to side B? Well, it varies for people, you know, in my own coaching and my wife and I, my wife is a mental performance coach, Olympic and world class. She works with uh, world and Olympic class athletes. And that's been a, a, a journey of over 30 years to get to where she is today. But ultimately, how do we, it depends on the individuals where they're at. Do you understand what your core values are? What do you really stand for? And I'm not talking about moral values, you know, about, uh, how you operate in society. I'm talking about what is important to you. What are your values? What are your core driving values? Do you even understand what they are? Do you know what they are? And are they your values 
or are they actually your parents' values or are they values of friends or family that you really don't own, but you live them? So that becomes an integrity question. So the first kind of phase of all of this is to step back and really ask yourself, what are my core values? And am I living my values? Many, and I would risk saying most people are not. They're living a life, they're in a TikTok world, not satisfied, not feeling good about themselves and living a set of values they're not even aware that they're living until they stop and reflect. And, you know, I work with a men's group that when I first started with them in this particular program many years ago, I asked these men, I go, so tell me, at the end of a day, at the end of a week, on occasion, do you stop to reflect about what your thoughts are? And I was actually surprised that in that group of 18 men, 16 of them said no. So to actually do the work called, I'll take responsibility for my life, in order for me to change, I have to start to understand myself. And self-reflection is the key to all of that. That awareness is always the first step. I hope that answered your question. I know it was a long answer. No, no, it was absolutely was fabulous answer. Fabulous answer. Very articulate. So when you found the 16 men, you discovered that they were not reflecting on their thoughts. They were mm -hmm. not improving their self-awareness. Mm -hmm. How would you lead them into the process, into the needle of saying, let's take a look at ourselves"? Well, let's first off say, you know, what are our values? You know, something, if I ask somebody what their core values are, and I'll say, give me your top five, because our, real, our life is a reflection of our values. That's full stop. Our life is a reflection of our values, whether they're intentional or not. And so some men have said to me, and some people, because we do it with both men and women, but this happened to be a men's group, they go, well, I don't know what my core values are. Like, I, I really don't know. Family, I guess, for sure. You know, and then they use words like integrity and they, all sorts of things. So the test for you in terms of if you're trying to discover what your values are, it's really quite simple. What do you think about? What do you talk about? What do you spend your money on? What do you surround yourself with? And what do you do on a day-to-day -day basis in terms of your activity? And that could be recreation. That could be job. When you look at that part of it, you are living into those values. We can't help it, by the way. Again, you don't have to be conscious of what they are. You are living your values. And so ultimately, if I get into the intellect and I say, what are your values? They say all the right things. Well, family, nothing's more important than family. My kids, nothing's more important than kids. If I ask women that question, they'll say, oh, nothing's more important than my husband and my kids. Nothing's more important than my family, my community, my church, my in-laws, whatever the case, they always are kind of, not always, they're often in that space. But when you really break that down, you go, oh, really? So tell me about that. Nothing's more important than your family. Yeah. Okay, great. So share with that. What, what time do you get up in the morning? Well, I'm up at six o'clock in the morning. And then what happens from there? Well, I, you know, I get ready for work and I head to work and I usually walk out the door by 730. Okay, great. Do you work out? Do you train? No, 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 no. I, I give the kids breakfast and then I'm off. Okay, great. So that's, that sounds pretty cool. And what happens when you get home? Well, I have to work late often or I'm traveling. And so then you start to unpack all of the minutia, the details of life. And you start to understand that although family, they say, is at the top list of their list, they are actually living a life that family's way down here. And there are another three, four or five things that actually are over top of family. Now, that's not to say that's pretty normal, by the way. And that's okay. But then you say, well, no, but I want family to be my core value. I want it to be the most important to me. Well, then you have to make different decisions. So as we start to unpack what our, what values we're living versus what we say our values are, it opens up a whole conversation of discovery. And again, this is the, the journey of self discovery is in reflection. You know, the quality of the questions you ask yourself is a, really drives the quality of the life that you will live. And so important to keep asking those questions, not up here, but getting beneath the surface. Mm -hmm. Does that help? So, yes. So you've been in work 30, 
40 years in your businesses, which I think is a tremendous accomplishment since you're only 29 <laughs> years old. Yeah, exactly. But, uh, but what has been the, the biggest catalyst to make people change that you've seen? I don't know that there's any one catalyst. I think that ultimately we have to look at our life and say, do we feel joy? Do we feel happy? Do we feel secure? Are we lit up? Are we excited about our life? And can we feel grateful? So if the answer to that is no, if you're grinding it out of bed in the morning, if you're wanting to hit the snooze button, if you're dissatisfied with your relationships, you're pissed off at some friends, you're complaining, you're blaming, you've got a low adversity quotient, a low AQ or a low EQ um, emotional quotient. If you start to recognize just how low those things are, then that will often drive change. Sometimes it's a significant other going, either you get your shit together or I'm done. You know, there's those, those fork in the road moments. Sometimes it's a health scare. You know, there's different, I guess, inspiration, if you will, for making a change in your life. And it can either come because of choice or because you've got no choice or suffer the consequences of not changing. So you also obviously are very um, articulate in describing the journey of life and things like that, because um, you obviously have been on that journey and I'm <laughs> sure digging into it pretty deeply because uh, you're, you're taking the medicine you're selling. You can tell that. So tell us a little bit about your journey. What made you fall off the journey and, you know, kind of fall back into old habits, but then get back on the saddle and start moving ahead again? Well, that's the human experience, isn't it? You know, we sometimes oscillate in and out. So we set the bar and we hit that bar, then we fall back. And hopefully we don't fall back to where we were. We just fall back. We go, oh shit, I got to put in the correction. And you go and you actually go a little higher. And then maybe you fall back a little bit, but you don't fall back all the way. And then you take another step and you go a little bit further. That's generally the human experience, isn't it? And so we all go through that. We've all done that. We've all been on a diet, come off the diet, do all those things, right? But, you know, my journey started... Literally, I turned 66 years old this year, and, I, and I'll, I'll touch on that briefly. But, you know, I've been together with my wife today for 35 years. And she was definitely, an, <laughs> I, I married up without question, you know, and she used to refer to me as her favorite Neanderthal. And I say that with the most kind of biggest smile and most fun because I reflect back on that time in my life. I go, oh my gosh, how did I score this woman? Number one, what did she see in me? And I'll, I'll share with you a little bit of a story that I think will give it context, which I was curt, I was a bruff. I was really raised on the wrong uh, side of the track. So my trust level was very low. Um, I was tough. I was a, a little bit, I'll say obnoxious at times. And still she hung out with me and I would respond to certain circumstances that she would witness. And she would say, why did you say that? Why do you do that? Like, why do you act that way? Why would you respond that way? And I'd look at her like she's kind of weird. And I go, it's just the way I am. And I think I used that enough times that one day I did something or said something or reacted a certain way. And she looked at me and she goes, why do you keep doing that? And I go, listen, it's just the way I am. And she looked at me and she said, sweetheart, you realize, of course, that's a choice. I went, what? And it was as if that moment she took a hammer and hit me right between the eyes. I go, can you expand on that just a little more? She goes, you're choosing to be the way you're being. Make a different choice. You're better than this. And so I began kind of reflecting and going on that journey. And over that period of time, I once asked her, I said, you know, what kept you in the relationship? And she says, I saw something in you. And it was shortly after that, that I read a quote that says, you know, a diamond is just a chunk of coal put under a great deal of pressure. I happened to be the coal. <laughs> My amazing wife happened to be the pressure. And so- And the diamond. <laughs> and, <laughs> and the diamond, the other diamond, right? And so that was really the start of that journey into, holy cow, everything uh, that I've got going on, my operating system, how I view the world is 
really just a choice. And, you know, it seems so simple now, but it was so deep back then. It was shortly after that that I read my probably favorite quote of all time. It's certainly one that I use often by Wayne Dyer, which was when you change the way you look at things, the things you look at change. All of these are, are pretty common, but especially back then, it was like profound. And as I've gone on this journey and grown and then worked with so many others, I start to realize that these are repeating patterns. These are certainly what many go through. And I just happen to be that individual that can see that. It's one of my gifts that I've developed over this many years and seeing through that with people. And so that's part of all of the journey that I've gone through and where I'm at today. So when I look at it today, again, 66 years old, I keep upping the benchmark. My vision for my life, my vision for myself and how I do that has shifted. So again, a long answer. I don't know if you want me to stop here or you want me to carry on, Ted. I'm good. Whatever you're comfortable with, but I do have a great question coming up. And that is, you obviously had the seed of interest to that, that, that came alive at the concept of a journey and self-discovery and improving yourself, working on yourself. Mm -hmm. How do you help somebody light that fire inside themselves when it's not really there? In other words, how do you bring that out or bring the best out in another person? Mm -hmm. Yeah, such a great question. I don't know that there's a one answer. What was the seed for me, by the way, was when I looked at my life, I was... I wasn't happy. I knew there was, and I believed or I hoped I was capable of more. I thought, gosh, life could be better. How do I do that? And so that journey was really the seed of that journey, the seed of my own journey in both business and in my own personal and professional development was driven by the just sheer unhappiness and the aspiration to literally be the best that I can be, to be my greatest self. And so that's a never ending journey, I think, because you always are able to improve. So within somebody else, how do we get to that place? You know, first off, we have to identify that as a coach, you know, I'm not a coax. So in other words, I coach, I don't coax. So are you coachable? Do you really want to achieve more? Do you really see yourself being more than you can be? There's a quote that I don't own, but I use it often. I don't know whose it is, which is confidence is rarely owned. It's almost always borrowed. And what I can do and what I do as a coach is Sometimes we have to believe in our clients more than they believe in themselves and then let them draw on us for their confidence and let them know that, number one, they got this. They can do this. You're not going through anything that many have not gone on, gone through before you. So these are all kind of methodology and tactics, but it's also having people reflect and consider that if they change the way they look at things, if they shift their perspective, then their perception changes. And that's where real change lives. Did you have role models growing up or even today? Who do you use as role models mm -hmm. to help, I will say, compare yourself against, but also motivate you to move beyond and higher performance? That's right now, for me, a perfect question. Because you know, one of the many things that I know are, are my highest values is my health. You know, over the years, I've got, I've had three sisters. I had three sisters. I still have three, I guess, technically. Two of them passed away from cancer. Now, I, and before they are right around 60 years old, I'm now 66 years old. I've always trained and I've always been very active. It's actually cathartic for me. I live on five acres in, outside of Vancouver, Canada, and it's, I like to be very active and, and physical in the work that I do. I train. I like to work out. That's a very, very important part of my life. It's one of my highest values. And I share that with you is that I have to, and what I've learned, and I share this as a, hopefully a hack for those listening, is I don't compare myself to others, but there are those individuals that I admire. And I admire not necessarily what they've achieved, but who they are. So I'll give you this hack that I have. I look at myself at 66 years old and I say, how do I want to be, who do I want to be? And how do I want to show up when I'm 70? 
gosh, you know, I'm 66 now, I'm active, I'm fit, I'm lean, I'm mean, I'm all those things. That's how I hold myself. But when I look at and say 70, what does that look like? Well, my hack is this. I look at somebody that I admire and I, I don't even know them. I know of them. I follow them. I think they've got some qualities, but they could be assholes. In this case, the person I admire is RFK Jr., Robert F. Kennedy Jr. I admire the qualities of that man. He's going to be almost 70 years old. Here's a guy who's very fit. He's articulate. He's active. Like, I mean, he's a busy dude. And he's out there and he's trying to change the world. I go, wow, those are some pretty amazing qualities. So I look at those qualities for me and, and do I want to change the world? Yeah, I want to be the change I want to see in my world. So I want to drive that. So I'm working backwards from a vision of who I am at 70. I use this in this example, RFK Jr. And I look at the qualities that I admire in him and that becomes my to-do list or my to-become list. And so now if I'm feeling lazy and I don't want to work out, maybe I want to uh, go off the rails in terms of what my goals are, my vision is, I ask myself the question, what would Kennedy do? Well, he'd show up. He'd be back in the gym. He'd say no to that bowl of ice cream. And that's not for me to say I'm going to deprive myself of all the fun things in life, mm -hmm. but it is a, a way for me to stay grounded in my vision. It's more concise. I have a list of all of the characteristics that I admire about him. And by the way, they don't have to be true. They're true for me. They don't have to be really true. If I said to RFK, these are your qualities that I see, he may go, no, that's really not who I am. <laughs> okay. Mm -hmm. I don't care. That's my story. Mm -hmm. So looking in the future, you had mentioned in a previous conversation, um, you're working now with professional and personal small group coaching. Mm -hmm. Tell us a little bit about that. Well, this was a journey we started a couple of years ago. And, you know, my wife and I have, she's traveled the world uh, far more than I have, by the way, because she's, again, working with athletes at a world and Olympic class. So she's often alongside of them. She's a mental performance coach. And our goal has always been to work together. We own businesses collectively, but we're always kind of in parallel, uh, but not together. And certainly we're always having conversations. I support her. She supports me. We talk business. We talk life. We do all the things. But we wanted to literally get intentional about working together because collectively we bring a lot. We started the Mindset Matters podcast three years ago, just half an hour every week. Her and I are riffing off some Mindset Matters ideas, sharing a little bit of our story and our life and what we face on any given uh, day or week and laugh at ourselves. But ultimately, we started those programs to say, let's bring together a small group of people that we can get really intimate with, that we can really unpack and align with. And so we put a methodology in place where we put the program together. And uh, generally what we did was put weekends together. So in other words, show up for this particular weekend. But leading into the weekend, our methodology was this. Let's get on a webinar. Let's have everybody meet each other. Then we'll have one-on-one -on -one calls with you. We'll discuss what it is that you're working backwards from. We'll meet one more time collectively as a group. Any questions? And we give them assignments, a couple of assignments, some homework to do. This all leads up to the in-person live weekend, Ted. And then on the Friday night, we get together and we just break bread. We have a nice evening. We get together. Well, what does that do? Well, by Saturday morning, when we get to work, when we get together, everybody's met each other. We all know why we're there. There's no having to be, oh, pleased to meet you. There's no discomfort. We literally get to work on Saturday morning and we end sometime later on Sunday afternoon. But within that body of work, we are aligning people, sharing experiences, and of course, giving them exercises and tasks and having really profound conversations with a small group of people. And uh, for many, it's been life-changing. What's interesting about that work is that of the, of the last session I did, uh, that we did, we called it Think Tank, Clarity Equals Velocity. That's my theme for 2024. My wife and I have a theme called Clarity Equals Velocity for 2024. Seven, I think, six or seven of my men said, I want to be part of this think tank and I want to bring my wife. 
and understanding that when you bring significant others together, that clarity between the mm-hmm. two creates profound velocity in life in general. And it turned into a kind of a couple's weekend, to be honest with you. And uh, that's happened more than once. And uh, we're happy to do that. So we're in the kind of uh, redesign, if you will, of our programs. But that's what we do. So what are some of the topics that you address in these sessions, the group sessions? Well, we unpack, of course, the values uh, conversation is really, really uh, a kind of a foundational component of what we bring. The other side of that is a reflection on really looking at what is the vision for your life and so that you're living into your vision based on your driving values. In the case of couples, what is it? What are you aligned with and understand each other's values? Where's the breakdown in communication? Those are all kind of topics that we, we address. Who is your circle of support? Who is your center uh, of influence? You know, part of the, philoso- uh, you know, philosophically and part of what we teach people is that they are the center of their universe. They are in the middle. And Whatever your universe is, I use the example often, Ted, because you would know this, and not that men don't do it, but women are certainly wired that way. And that is that they are givers. They want to look after their family, but they often do it at the cost of themselves. So as much as we talk about, you know, if a plane's going down, put on your oxygen mask before, you know, before you help anybody else, it's kind of that concept is that you need to be what will feel often like you're being selfish, but understanding that you can't run on empty. The tank can't be drained. You can't be constantly giving without refueling. And what does that refueling look like? Where do you give yourself time? Where do you, I don't know, do you, are you going for a spa treatment? Are you taking a break? Are you uh, looking after yourself mentally, emotionally, physically? Are you going to a weekend workshop where you can just be focused on you? And so that you're actually refueling the tank so that you have the energy. And often what happens, and you would probably even know of friends and family who've done this, where for 25 years, they give, 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 give. And then one day they wake up after the kids have left and they've gone, I'm done. I'm done. I'm empty. And I'm, uh, this relationship sucks. I'm out. And then all of a sudden you go, what the hell just happened? And it was because along the way, they didn't refuel, they didn't communicate, they compromised their values. And at the end of the day, things go off the rails many years later because you haven't actually looked after yourself on the journey and you blame others. And ultimately what we do is really support people in doing exercises that show them how they can in fact look after themselves and take responsibility for their life. We operate under a fundamental, no blame, no complaint. So I have seen very often that there is a direct reflection and correlation between the quality of relationships people have outside of work with the relationships they have inside of work. Sure. I would ask you that I am sure I'm going to assume that some of the people who attend your group sessions like that are business owners or business leaders. Yep. So what's the outcome? What's the effect when they go back to business after learning the values and learning the concepts that you're guiding them through? What's the effect on their business? Well, those are ultimately all decisions that have to be made. They have to put in maybe some corrections. They have to say, how, do, how am I operating? Am I being as communicative as I need to be or should be, could be? Am I willing to have uncomfortable conversations? What I would call courageous conversations. Am I willing to take a stand for the vision I have and take a stand for my values? Or am I going to continue to compromise my values and how I operate, how I do business. And these are all kind of decisions that have to be made that then actions that have to be put in place. This goes back to where we started this conversation, Ted. These are changes that we need to put in, that we decide we're going to make, but the transition is very, very difficult. If we still have time, I'll give you a great example in business is that as the CEO of my business, in one of my businesses, so my business in another city, in another province, I've got a great team, but every year I get together 
And now I haven't had a key to that business since 2006. I get on a every two week call. I check in with my general manager. I'm always, you know, aware of my financials, all the things that are happening. But every year I get together and I bring everybody into a fundamental space, common space. We break bread, we have lunch, but I'm, it's a workshop. It's a one day, sometimes two day workshop. And I bring in all of the full-time staff, the part-time staff. I even find, I even bring in some of my really close suppliers and what I would call trusted partners. And I workshop for the weekend. And what am I driving there is I'm saying, I'm going to create culture and I want to make sure my culture is aligned with everybody. And I'm going to give you a how to do that. And for those of you who are entrepreneurs and business owners, this is such a great strategy and, and technique. And that is, is I facilitate a conversation with everybody. I have a flip chart in front of me. I go, okay, team, you work here. You're here every day. What is the culture that you want to work within? What is the environment you want to create? Two separate conversations. And they just yell out answers. Culture, okay? No complain, no blame, no gossip. Ah, it's toxic. No bitching, no whining, no talking behind each other's back. We've got each other's back. We're front facing. We're looking after the clients. And I'm just listing things down. I'm prompting. I know what answers I'm looking for, but my job as a facilitator is to ask the question so they come up with the answers. We write that whole thing down. We got this whole page and I go, okay, here's all the qualities that you say you want. Show up on time, got each other's back, no gossip, no talking behind each other's back. Do what you say you're going to do, be front facing. So we go through that whole list. I go, anything that we need to add? No, 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 all good. Is there anything that we need to take off this list because we can't execute? Nope, all good. So do we all collectively agree this is the culture? Yes, if we could live that culture, it would be awesome. Go great. Then so it is. Everybody come by and initial this sheet. And they all come by and they all take a felt pen and we go through it and they initial that sheet. I go, great. Now hang this sheet somewhere in the shop, in an office where everybody can see it. And that's what they do. Now what we've done is we've set the benchmark for how we operate culturally. So now my general manager, myself, if the team bumps up against something, part of the culture they agree to is no complain, no blame. If they have a confrontation with somebody because they're driven to do and to succeed, there's going to be head budding. If they can't resolve it, they then get somebody who can handle the complaint and they go to whatever supervisory position that's in there and they get it handled. But that's an agreement. But what happens most of the time, Ted, is if somebody complains, somebody blames, somebody comes in late, they'll look at that sheet and go, guys, what the hell is going on? This is not what we agreed to. Ted, this isn't what we agreed to. You agreed to showing up on time. You're, you're breaking our agreement. That's not okay. That's part of our culture, by the way, honoring agreements. So you start to see that that's driven by me, the pointy end of the spear, because those values are important to me. That culture matters to me. And I'm happy to say that, you know, my full-time staff, many of them have been with me over 20 years. A couple of them have been 35 years, uh, often five and six and seven years. Uh, you know, it's pretty common. So, Patrick, you've had a very rewarding life, I would imagine, and you've gotten through a lot of transitions and you managed your journey through life. I want to congratulate you on that. In today's conversation, we've got an awful lot of exercises and tips and different things in managing change and implementing in our lives so that we can have holistic success. I'd like to thank you very, very much for your time. And I'd like to say for our viewers, um, if you want to get in touch or you want to contact, it's his website is the everyday millionaire.ca. Patrick, thank you very much for your time today. Ted, thanks for the opportunity. I've enjoyed it. Hi, Ted Wolf here. I want to thank you for joining us for this Implementers video. The Implementers podcast is presented by Guidewise, where we, along with our vetted member community, recognize that ideas are easy, but implementation is hard. To learn more about getting things done with Guidewise, please visit us at guidewise.io. And to conquer your implementation struggles, please like 
and share this video and subscribe to our channel. Happy implementing.